Hi everyone, this is Dr. Hall. We're going to do part two of the heart, lecture number 25, and we're going to talk about the cardiac conduction system and the coronary circulation. So that's our agenda for today. So I don't know if this GIF will work for the recording. Let's see. Mm, no. So there's a website here. Uh, if you just download the regular PowerPoint file or the outline, uh, you can kind of see a heart in motion. It's kind of neat to see the atria contract and then the ventricles. So let's do a brief review of cardiac anatomy from last time. So we have blood coming in through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava entering the right atrium here. It's then going to move through the tricuspid valve down into the right ventricle. Remember the AV valves have the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles because they need to be very strong. Then the ventricle is going to contract, send blood moving out through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries out to the lungs where it's going to get oxygenated. Blood is then going to travel back from the lungs into the heart through the pulmonary arteries, which are red, into the left atrium. Then it's going to move down through the bicuspid or mitral valve into the left ventricle, which is then going to contract and send it out through the aortic valve into the aorta and out to the rest of the body. All right. We talked about the cardiac cycle. So remember at first, both the atria and the ventricles are going to be relaxed or in diastole, and we have passive filling of the heart with blood. Then step two, the atria are going to contract and push all of the blood into the ventricles. Then the ventricles are going to contract, which is going to close the AV valves, and so the blood is going to move out through the arteries, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And then we go back to diastole, and the semilunar valves are going to close to prevent any backflow of blood into the ventricles. It's the closing of those valves that cause the two heart sounds, lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. So lub is the closing of the AV valves, which happens during ventricular systole. And then dub, the second sound, is what happens when the semilunar valve slams shut at the end of ventricular systole or ventricular contraction. All right, so now we're going to talk about the cardiac conduction system. So it's really important with the cardiac cycle that we time everything just right. We don't want the ventricles to contract until after the atria have contracted and we've given enough time for all the people to move from the lobby into the theater, right? We've given enough time for all of the blood to move from the atria into the ventricles and then we want the ventricles to contract and then we need everybody to relax and we need to have diastole that's long enough to allow for sufficient filling. So we need to have a conductor, right? We need to have something that is controlling and regulating this. And that would be this cardiac conduction system. It's an electrical system and it's made of special nodal tissue. So this tissue is kind of weird. It's kind of like cardiac muscle and it's kind of like nervous tissue. It's a little bit of both. It's very strange and special. And it's what's gonna send and regulate these electrical impulses that tell the cardiac muscle in the different chambers of the heart when to contract. So the first part of the cardiac conduction system is the SA node, which stands for sinoatrial node. It's located high up in the right atrium here, and it is often called the pacemaker of the heart because it is what's going to initiate each of your heartbeats when things are working normally. The way that's going to happen is that the SA node is going to send out an electrical impulse. And that electrical impulse is going to move into the cardiac myocytes that are directly adjacent to that. And it's going to cause them to depolarize. They're going to have an action potential that travels down their sarcolemma. 
And then that depolarization is not only going to cause that myocyte to contract, but it's going to signal the next myocyte to depolarize. So you get this kind of like wave-like signal that radiates out from the SA node into both atria, causing this kind of like warm, this kind of like big, slow contraction, which makes sense, right? We're just kind of moving the blood down into the ventricles, doesn't need a lot of force, doesn't need to be very sudden, it can be kind of a gentle thing. So there's no, quote, wiring between the SA node and the next part of the conducting system. We're relying on these action potentials, waves of action potentials just kind of being uh, perpetuated through the myocytes in the atria. So that's the first part of our heartbeat. Next, from the SA node, this wave of action potentials is going to eventually reach the second part, which is the AV node, which is sitting low in the right atrium near the ventricles. So it's also the atrioventricular node because it's kind of in this base of the right atrium. Now the first thing the AV node is going to do is it's going to say, wait for it. It's going to pause the signal. It's going to receive that signal and then hold on to it for a minute to allow the atria to finish pushing all of the blood into the ventricles as much as possible. Then, after pausing for a moment, after waiting for a minute, the AV node is going to send its electrical signal into the next part of the system, which is the AV bundle. Now, this part, right, so we've done SA node, goes through the atria, gets to the AV node, that's all been relatively slow and then we had a pause. This next phase is going to be fast. So once the AV node descends to go ahead and send its signal, it's going to go first down the AV bundle, which is like a wire, and then go into two different branches, the left and right bundle branches. And the left and the right bundle branches carry the signal like wires, lightning fast, super, super duper fast, into the walls of the ventricles, where then it's going to move out into these little tiny branching fibers, Purkinje fibers, that go out to all the different areas of the ventricular walls. So what's going to happen is really quickly, the signal goes to every myocyte in the ventricles all pretty much at the same time. So this is very different from how the SA, SA node signal went through the atria. That was kind of a wah, 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 kind of a slow wave, like doing the wave in a stadium. But from the AV node, once it decides to send the signal on through the AV bundle, the right and left bundles, and the Purkinje fibers, it's like whoosh. It's really fast because we need the ventricles to contract forcefully and strongly all at once because they have a big job to do. So the SA node on its own will send an impulse. It's just kind of autorhythmic. It will send an impulse about every 0.85 seconds or about 70 times per minute. So if you could pull somebody's heart out of their body and keep it alive, it would beat about 70 times per minute. But it's not totally on its own. So you might remember that the heart gets nerve fibers from both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems, right? So it's gonna be responding to signals from the medulla oblongata. If the medulla activates the sympathetic nervous system, it's going to speed up the SA node, such as if you're nervous or stressed, or when you're exercising and you need to have more cardiac output. Conversely, if you're really relaxed, then you might activate your parasympathetic nervous system and that would slow your heartbeat down. So it can be really interesting to check your own pulse, check your own heart rate, and see how many times per minute is your heart beating. If it's more than about 70, then you know your sympathetic nervous system is activated. If it's less than 70, you know your parasympathetic nervous system is activated. The other thing that can change the heart rate and speed up or slow down the SA node, primarily speed up, is hormones released by the adrenal gland. So both epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are stress hormones, can be released by the adrenal gland and they will also speed up the heart. So remember we've talked about different ways of signaling things in the body. You can have the nervous system 
and you can have hormones. So when you need something that's kind of short term and immediate, you're going to use the nervous system. But if it's kind of longer term, you're going to use hormones. Now, if the SA node isn't working for some reason, or if its signal isn't getting through, the AV node will say, oh, guess it's up to me then. And it'll send an impulse about every one to one and a half seconds, or about 40 to 60 times per minute. This is an excellent backup system. But for most people, this isn't fast enough to then kind of do much at all. So then if you want to exercise or go up a flight of stairs, uh, because the AV node doesn't get any direct um, signals from the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous systems, you can't speed it up. So it doesn't work well for long term, but it, it's enough to keep you alive, that's for sure. And not feeling too terrible, maybe a little tired. And then, if the AV node isn't working for some reason, the cardiac muscle itself, so remember we talked about how cardiac muscle is autorhythmic, how just a clump of cardiac muscle cells in a petri dish will contract regularly, they will beat, right? But that autorhythmic contraction happens only about 30 to 40 beats per minute, right? So this is the backup to our backup, and so it's super slow. It will keep you alive, but most people feel pretty miserable if their heart rate is down around 30. So if your SA node or your AV node aren't working properly, a lot of people will then get a pacemaker. So if you've ever known someone who had a pacemaker, this is a small electronic device, battery powered, that is placed underneath the skin of the chest and then there are wires that go from the pacemaker into the subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic vein and down through the subcla or superior vena cava into the heart. And oftentimes, then one of the wires is going to go to where the SA node normally is. And then sometimes there's going to be another one that goes down into the ventricle as well. Here's an x-ray. You can see this person has one placed on the other side of their chest, right? So it's all underneath the surface of the skin. And so what that's doing is literally sending little tiny electric shocks down into the heart to tell it when to beat. So one of the ways that we can look at what's happening with the cardiac conduction system is by looking at an EKG or electrocardiogram. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, cardio starts with C. Why is this a K? Um, sometimes you'll see it as ECG, um, which would be more correct for English, but this actually comes from the German. And so um, EKG was the first um, thing that it was called because in German, cardio is with a K or their equivalent, um, and it's just kind of stuck. So EKG or ECG, they're the same thing. So this is a way to measure and record the electrical activity of the heart. And what we do is we put a whole bunch of electrodes with wires on them and stick them to different places on somebody's chest. Now we are not going to give them any electricity through these wires. We are merely sensing the electrical signals that are already coming from the heart. And so we're going to see this pattern, this waveform that goes, there's a little wave and then there's a big wave and then there's kind of a medium size wave. So this first wave here is called the P wave and that is when the atria are depolarizing. That's when that action potential is going down their sarcolemmas and they are contracting. Because this is kind of a gradual wah 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 through the atria, this is a relatively long or wide waveform as all those atrial cells contract. Then we have a pause, right, as we wait for it, and the AV node kind of holds on to that signal, and then it decides, okay, bam. <laughs> and then we have this big wave, because this is the impulse going down through the AV bundle, right and left bundle, Purkinje fibers, and the ventricle, ventricular myocytes are contracting. Then we have this last wave out here, and that is ventricular repolarization. So what's happening now is that we're re-establishing those concentration gradients, 
right? We're getting back to having a, a basically a resting potential, right? So now all those cardiac myocytes are having to pump sodium back outside their plasma membrane so that they can do an action potential to trigger muscular contraction the next time they get told to. So here's another example of an EKG. You can see right there is where the P wave starts. So that's when the SA node sends its signal. That's going to kind of move through the atria. And then we're going to have our AV node is going to wait for a minute and then go ahead and send its signal down into the ventricles. Then the ventricles are going to repolarize and get set up for the next contraction. So here's another example of a normal EKG. So we call this first one for atrial contraction, the P wave. The ventricular contraction wave is called the QRS. And then the repolarization wave is called the T wave. Here's an example of a normal EKG up here, normal. It's a little fast, but pretty normal. So we see a P wave, we see a QRS, and we see a T wave. And every single heartbeat, P wave, QRS, T wave. If we look at the EKG down below, I'm like, okay, P wave, QRS, T. And then, oh, is this a P? What's happening here? Oh, here's a QRS. And a T. Oh, look, there's a little P wave there. Here's another P wave. There's another P wave. What is going on? So in this person, their P wave, their atrial contraction, for some reason that signal is not getting to the AV node. So the AV node is just like, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Now? Like it just can't hear anything. So the AV node then, because it can't seem to hear the signal that's coming from the SA node, he's just sending the signal on his own, right? So this is that less frequent, that kind of slower heart rate, not listening to the P wave at all. The AV node is just sending the signal on his own, right? Here's another one. So again, the top EKG is normal. And the bottom EKG looks really strange. So first of all, it's really slow, right? Many fewer heartbeats in the same amount of time. And it's also very wide. That QRS is super wide. And we don't see a P wave at all, <laughs> OK? So what this is, is this is the ventricles contracting for themselves. So in the absence of a signal from an SA node or from an AV node, the ventricles are just going to do their own thing. It's really slow, but it can often keep you alive. Here's what a pacemaker would look like on EKG. So it actually, here's this little spike. That is the pacer spike. That is the electrical signal that is being sent from the pacemaker. In this individual, we're again seeing a wide, strangely shaped QRS. So this is a pacemaker that is just going right to the ventricle. This person has a lot of heart disease. Let's look at another example. Ah, <laughs> so this is a really, really fast heartbeat. Look at all those heartbeats. Bum, 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 bum right? So that's called tachycardia. So if it's too fast, it's called tachycardia. Alternatively, if it's too slow, it's called bradycardia. <laughs> here is another one. What is going on here? A whole lot of nothing is going on here. So what's happening here is this is a completely disorganized signals. And so if you look at somebody's heart when this is what's happening electrically, it's described as like a bag of worms. You're getting contractions in different parts of the hearts and different part, parts of the heart, different, part, different chambers, different parts of the chambers, all at different times. This complete disorganization of the conduction system, complete chaos. 
and this is what's called ventricular fibrillation. So if a chamber is just kind of just quivering because all the muscle cells are contracting at different times, that's called fibrillation. So this is ventricular fibrillation. So you can imagine if your ventricles are just quivering rather than periodically contracting all at once in unison, then you're not actually pumping blood. So this is a absolute life-threatening emergency. This is what we shock people for, right? So in the medical dramas, when they go clear and they put the paddles and ka-ching, right? What they're treating is ventricular fibrillation because you can't survive this. No blood is going anywhere. You're not pumping blood at all when you're in ventricular fibrillation. And so why do we shock them? It sounds so barbaric, and it is in a way, but sometimes it acts like a reset button. And so, you know, once it gets disorganized like this, sometimes if you just force them all to contract at the same time by giving them electrical signal, then they'll restart again and they'll go um, in their normal pattern. So I mentioned earlier that somebody looked like they had a lot of heart disease. So when we talk about heart disease, we could be talking about a lot of different things. But one of the things we could be talking about is trouble with the coronary circulation. So now we're going to talk about the coronary circulation. So the heart muscle itself is relatively thick. And so, since there's thickness to the walls of all the chambers, you can't rely on the blood that's sitting inside the chambers of the heart. You have to have your own set, right, of blood vessels to deliver oxygen and nutrients and remove carbon dioxide and wastes, right? So the heart muscle itself needs its own blood vessels. So that's the coronary circulation. And so we have coronary arteries, which are carrying oxygenated blood to the heart tissues. And we have coronary veins, which are carrying deoxygenated blood from the heart tissues, right? So those coronary arteries, there are two main ones, the right and the left. And they're going to come right off of the aorta. So I always say ABCs. It's aorta, brachiocephalic, trunk, common carotid on the left, and subclavian on the left. But actually, the first arteries to come off of the aorta just after the aortic valve are the right and left coronary arteries. Now, just to orient you for a moment, this is the right ventricle here. This is the left ventricle over here. So this coming up and out is our pulmonary trunk. And the pulmonary trunk goes anterior to where the left coronary artery comes out. So you can see how it's kind of ghosted in there. The left coronary artery comes out this way, behind that pulmonary artery. The left coronary artery is pretty short, and then it's going to branch into an artery that comes down the anterior surface of the heart. So it is called the anterior interventricular, which means between the ventricles, because this is left ventricle, this is the right ventricle artery. Or sometimes it's called the left anterior descending artery. Both terms are correct. So the left coronary artery branches into the anterior interventricular artery and then another artery over here, which is going to circle around the posterior side of the heart. And so that's called the circumflex artery. So that's pretty handy. It circumflex circles around posteriorly. For the veins, we also need to then drain used up deoxygenated blood from the heart muscle. So on the anterior surface of the heart, running along with the anterior interventricular artery, taking blood away from those tissues, we're going to have the great cardiac vein. On the anterior right surface of the heart, so draining blood from the right ventricle, we have the small cardiac vein. And then on the posterior surface of the heart, so you can see it's kind of ghosted in here, you have the middle cardiac vein. So all three of these veins are going to empty into a big vein called the coronary sinus, which is on the posterior surface of the heart. That coronary sinus is then going to drain that blood into the right atrium. Because remember, all venous blood containing deoxygenated blood, blue blood, is going to dump into the right atrium. 
So, so far we've talked about how the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava drain blood into the right atrium, which is true, but we also have this additional blood vessel, the coronary sinus, which also drains deoxygenated blood from the heart muscle into the right atrium. So if you have problems with your coronary arteries, you're going to have problems delivering sufficient oxygen and glucose and other nutrients to your cardiac myocytes. So if you get a blockage, as shown here, right? So if for some reason there's a block here and blood can't get through, then this entire region of the heart that's dependent on that artery for bringing it its blood supply, bringing in its oxygen and glucose, that tissue is gonna be damaged and potentially die. And that's called a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, right? So what a heart attack is, is death of heart muscle tissue due to a blockage of the coronary arteries. That's what it is. This is that same information in text, so if you didn't get all that, you can pause it here. So why do blockages happen? We've talked about this already. So good old atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, those plaques that can accumulate in the walls of the arteries, right? So they start small and they can get really big over time. And then sometimes a blood clot will just lodge in there and block off the little tiny opening that remains. Right? So this is how we get blockages in our coronary arteries, is through this process of atherosclerosis. Here's an example. This is part of an aorta, actually. So this one here is a normal person's aorta. This one here is an atherosclerotic aorta, right? So all that fatty cholesterol deposits and plaque buildup. Yuck, right? So what causes atherosclerosis? Here's another, this is the inside wall of an aorta, right? Yuck. So we've already talked about these, but so really quickly, hypertension or high blood pressure by causing kind of too much pressure inside the vessels causes micro tears that can initiate plaque formation. Oftentimes high blood pressure is genetic, but there are other factors as well, like inactivity, stress, a high salt diet, alcohol, and certain drugs, especially drugs that act like, mimic, or activate the sympathetic nervous system, like cocaine or other stimulants like crystal meth. Diabetes, right? That high blood glucose makes your blood vessels too brittle and more prone to damage on these internal walls. Diabetes is often due to an unhealthy diet and lack of exercise and can also be genetic or even autoimmune in the case of type 1 diabetes. High cholesterol contributes to plaque. It's also often genetic in terms of what it causes you to have high cholesterol, but certainly eating high, a diet high in saturated fats can also contribute to the problem. And tobacco and nicotine is directly toxic to the blood vessels, and there's no evidence that e-cigarettes or nicotine alone in the form of gum or patches it are safer in regard to this. So coronary artery disease is atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries. If you get a complete blockage that causes a heart attack or death of heart muscle tissue, right? You can kind of see that there. If you have a partial blockage, that can cause what's called angina. Angina is a chest pain that occurs during exertion, right? So if you have a blockage like this, right? So right here is the blockage, but you can see it's not complete because there is blood flow that fills uh, further down. This is, by the way, an angiogram. So this is an x-ray where they've um, used a catheter to go to the opening of a coronary artery and injected dye in it and taken an x-ray picture. It's pretty amazing. So this is a partial blockage on um, angiography and this person, if they're just sitting around watching TV, might feel fine because their heart muscle isn't working very hard. But then when they have to get up and walk around or go up some stairs and their heart muscle has to work more, they may not be able to meet that increased demand for oxygen and glucose and they would develop chest pain um, with exertion, with exercise, and that's called angina. So how do we treat um, acute coronary disease? How do we treat a heart attack? 
we have three basic uh, approaches. One is if we think all of a sudden a clot ended up blocking off the remainder of an opening of an artery that was already narrowed by atherosclerosis, there is a medicine called TPA that dissolves clots that we can use on an emergency basis. It's a risky medicine to use because it can cause you to bleed in lots of places, uh, right? So blood clotting is important, uh, but it can be life-saving, absolutely. If we are at a hospital that has more advanced capabilities and they can do something called a cardiac catheterization, then what they're gonna do is take that person to their catheterization lab and insert a catheter, a little tube, in through their femoral artery and then kind of go backwards through the arterial system. They'll go from the femoral artery into the external iliac, common iliac, aorta, and then come all the way up, you know, kind of going backwards against the direction of blood supply through the aortic arch into the ascending aorta to where the opening of the coronary arteries are. And then they'll thread this tube. It's amazing. They'll thread this tube into the coronary artery and they'll see if they can get it you know, and kind of poke it through that area where the blockage is. And then they have this thing called a stent. It's like this little girder and they kind of use a balloon to expand it. And basically they push the artery back open again. They squish that plaque out and form an opening. And so that's called a stent. So if you ever know anybody who's had a cardiac cath, so one of the things they'll do is inject that dye so they can see what's going on. And then sometimes they will do a stent shown here to then kind of prop those arteries open again. So there's a website here of that procedure. It's really quite amazing to watch. Sometimes that won't work or sometimes that will work only temporarily. And so sometimes we'll do a coronary artery bypass graft, right? And so what that does is we take a blood vessel from somewhere else in the body and we basically create a detour. We create a new pathway to get past, if this is where your blockage was, Right? We're going to create a detour path to get blood to where it needs to go. The blood vessel most commonly used for a bypass graft is none other than the great saphenous vein. So remember that really long, really superficial vein that starts kind of down the inside of your ankle and travels all the way up into the thigh? Well, if you need to, you can take that out, right? And they will actually use sections of that vein, sew one end of it into the aorta, and sew the other end of it on the other side of the blockage to get blood flow to that heart muscle. Whoever thought of that, I don't know. It's pretty amazing. If someone has had multiple heart attacks or some other types of heart disease, and they get to the point where their heart is not able to effectively pump blood. So if the heart muscle is really weakened and thin and can't pump well, what happens then is you kind of get some back pressure into the veins, right? So the veins that are bringing blood from the body into the heart, so the superior and inferior vena cava, as well as the pulmonary veins that are bringing blood from the lungs into the heart. And so particularly if it's the left ventricle that's having trouble, you can get this back pressure in the left side of the heart, left atrium causes back pressure into the pulmonary veins, increasing their hydrostatic pressure, which is then going to cause fluid to leak out into the tissues, which is called edema. And so leakage of fluid out into the lung tissues is called pulmonary edema. So what we can see here is the abnormal chest x-ray and the lungs which should be pretty black because they're filled with air are all filled with just kind of this white puffy stuff that is fluid so when people are having heart failure and pulmonary edema they're kind of drowning in their own lungs right so that's what heart failure is you can get atherosclerosis, of course, in other arteries and blockages in other arteries as well, which can then cause damage or, to or death of the cells and the tissues supplied by those arteries. 
if you get atherosclerosis of the blood vessels to your brain, such as your internal carotid artery, your vertebral arteries, or your basilar artery, right, and blood can't flow up into the brain, then that section of the brain is going to not be able to function well and may even die. So that's what a stroke is, right? So it's when part of your brain tissue dies because of lack of blood supply. In older people, stroke is almost always caused by atherosclerosis. In younger people, so people your age, it's very uncommon. And when it does happen, it's usually a blood clot or a problem in the structure of the blood vessel to begin with, like an aneurysm. So you may be familiar with some of the signs of a stroke, right? So if one side of their face is drooping, if their arms are weak, if they cannot speak clearly, or if they have a, and then especially if they have a really bad headache associated with it, then you need to call 911 because time is of the essence. We want to restore blood supply to that tissue as quickly as possible. If you get atherosclerosis in the penis, that's actually what causes erectile dysfunction in older men. So the way an erection works normally is you get a huge increase of blood supply into these erectile tissues of the penis that then swell and engorge with blood. And if you don't have nice open arteries, you can't get that blood supply in there quickly enough. So uh, the way Viagra works, for example, is it forces the arteries to open exceptionally wide to force the, them to be able to fill the penis with blood. This is not what causes erectile dysfunction in young men, however, that's a whole other conversation. So how do you prevent atherosclerosis? Um, no tobacco, no nicotine. Those are just um, really well known. Now we all have that story of, you know, Uncle Fred who smoked two packs a day and lived to be 101. Those people are anomalies. That is not generally um, what happens. Those people are exceptions to the rule. Uh, you also want to limit alcohol. So drinking more than four drinks a week for female-bodied people or seven drinks a week for male-bodied people is actually associated with increased risk of high blood pressure. Um, interestingly, anything more than two to four drinks a week is also associated with an increased risk of cancer. So um, the less alcohol, the better for the most part for all of us. Of course, eating a healthy diet and then be really active and move your body. So the evidence is really strong that as long as you are fit, so as long as you move your body and you do some aerobic exercise and you get your heart rate and your blood pressure up and your respiratory rate and you move your body and you are fit, that is far more important than your overall body size. So it's not so much about how much you weigh or what your pant size is, it's actually more about how fit are you in terms of how strong is your body? So um, be active, move your body no matter what shape it is, right? <laughs> Just move it and it's really healthy for you. And then of course, if you do develop things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol or diabetes, take care of them, right? Work with your doctor, take medicines if needed to get them under control so that you don't develop atherosclerosis over time. So that's it for this lecture. There's a nice little review video here that you can watch. We'll pick up next time by talking about some further regulation of the cardiovascular system and doing some case-based learning.